Yeah, to me, it's an instrument that can sound really heavy, uh, like you can put a lot of energy into it because it all comes from your breath. And uh, if you're <laughs> if you're really pushing hard, the sound that come out of the instrument can be pretty intense. And I think that fits metal pretty well. And so I think that's the first reason. Um, besides that, I think since we are doing like a progier side of metal, it's been really common basically to, to try to find new sonorities and stuff like that and saxophone is just one way to to achieve that hey what's up vox and hops heads i'm matt the vocalist of cryptopsy and the host of the vox and hops metal podcast brought to you by sound talent media and evergreen podcasts where i sit down with fellow metal musicians to talk about their lives music and craft beer hope you've been having a glorious week i most certainly have been before we jump into today's episode, I'd just like to ask you to follow the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast on the podcast platform of your choice. But more than that, I'm also asking you to tell a friend about the podcast. If there is someone in your life, someone that you first discovered metal with, first off, you should write them and let them know how much you miss them and how much they mean to you. But you should also let them know that the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast exists. You can tell them that there are over 300 episodes with some of the world's best metal musicians available on all podcast platforms for them to discover. If you would encourage one of your friends to become a brand new Vox and Hops head, that would be something that I would truly appreciate. Now today on the podcast, I'm with Vince Wilke of Fractal Universe. Get ready, everyone. This is Vox and Hops episode number 333. Oh, I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everyone? Today I'm with Vince Will Kang of Fractal Universe. Uh, Vince, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. What about you? I'm doing great. It's 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 you know it's cold. We're we're I live in Canada in Montreal, and it's that time of the year when uh, it gets really cold. But uh, that's okay because we can still hang out and talk about life, metal, and craft beer, and that makes me very very happy. Uh, let's jump straight into the meat of things. I like to start off with the shittiest question first. Uh, how did you cope with the glorious years? of 2020 and 2021 and hopefully not 2022 how did you cope with this beautiful yeah. pandemic that just won't go away yeah we've been trying our best to remain busy i mean we released an album in last mm -hmm. june which we recorded during the pandemic and all of that stuff so i guess we managed to do the best out of it and also we started the twitch channel and streamed a little bit over there and have written a couple couple of new songs already so yeah, trying to do the best out of things, but uh, what's missing is really tours and uh, and more shows. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's what we're supposed to be doing. It's a big part of our lives yeah, to 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 is. be able to have the yin and the yang. That's what I loved about my life prior to the pandemic was I would go on tour, and I would love being on tour, and then I would miss being at home, and then I'd come home, and then enjoy being at home, and then miss being on tour that yin and yang of my lifestyle is, is really upside down. How about you? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely something missing. Uh, <laughs> as you said, it's a big part of our lives and uh, just the contact with the, the fans and all of that and the, the adrenaline that you get from shows, there's nothing really that can replace that. So, <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, I call that uh, filling the void, Yeah, <laughs> which we'll get to later. <laughs> Vox and Hops is all about hanging out with my metal friends, talking about their lies, music, and craft beer. Now, what are you going to be drinking today that we're going to be sharing virtually? I'm going to drink a green mint tea. Hell yes, today. healthy. Love it. Antioxidants, good for you. Yeah. Uh, I will not be drinking tea today. I will be drinking a beer, and it's bloody cold, as I mentioned here in Montreal. Yeah. So I'm going to be drinking uh, something completely different and completely opposite of that. This is from La Gabiaire. This is their tiki sour uh, cassis. Uh, it has a uh, cassis is currants, black currants. Uh, it's, so it's a sour beer with black currants in it. A six percent La Gabiaire uh, make a bunch of uh, very cool beer here in Quebec. And uh, this one is a, a wacky sour and they actually sent me a glassware to go with it. And I typically don't do that, but because it's so cold today, I thought it'd be funny to actually use the glassware that someone sets me for it. So I'm gonna pour this out. And while I pour this out, I would love to hear about um, your very first beer. Do you remember the first beer that you ever drank with? I'm not sure. I think it was like at the show when I was like, uh... 12 or something, I, a show I attended in a nearby village and uh, 
yeah, we'll just, uh, let, let's try that. It sounds interesting. And I remember I didn't really like it at first. I pretended I did because, yeah, you have to be cool. <laughs> but I really didn't like the taste at first. <laughs> we all tend to do that. Hey, that first, I remember my first beer too. And I remember it taking so long to finish. You know what I mean? Nowadays, it's, it just disappears. But those, that first beer, you hold it till it gets warm. And if it's warm, typically we buy shitty beer when we start too. It's not craft beer or like fancy beers such as this one something that you know has a fruit flavoring to it uh it uh as it as it gets warmer it tastes even more horrible so this is a, a ridiculous glassware that they sent me which is basically like a it's like a tiki uh, hawaiian style um face it's it's sort of ridiculous but here we go cheers cheers and i also brought the last beer i drank oh, cool. since i'm not go, drinking go one it, yeah. today in, in, this in, is a Belgian it, yeah. abbey ale which is pretty strong. It's like 10 degrees, but it was pretty good. I'm usually not a big fan of stronger beers, but uh, this one, I must say, was, was really tasty. And it was offered to me by a student of mine. So a nice present for Christmas. I love that. Uh, love those presents and keep them coming, people. Uh, we love beer and uh, it's the best, best present, honestly. <laughs> this is tart. Um, it's uh, the black currants are very subtle just lightly sweet, um, very smooth, 6% goes down really nice. The color is gorgeous, uh, like a deep red leaning towards the purple. Gorgeous, mega BI, killing it as always. Um, let's jump into craft beer. At what point did you realize, or did you ever realize that beer could be more than that first beer that you had at that concert, uh, that beer could be something that can be enjoyable? I don't know, I think it happened over time. Then I think, when you are growing up, beer is more like uh, something for parties and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and that it really takes time to to learn how to enjoy it. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm not like the biggest specialist on beers and stuff like that, but I still enjoy it for 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 its merits. Like I, I usually drink IPAs and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, love it. Um, let's talk about the craft beer scene in France. Has it has it blown up? You're talking about drinking IPAs which is something that when I have toured, I guess the last time I went through Europe was in 2018. I'm like, no, 2019 with Ingested. Uh, I don't remember really stumbling onto many craft beers in France. Uh, has it taken off since then? I wouldn't really be sure about that. I know we have a lot of Belgian ale. I think there mm -hmm. are a lot more into that stuff. And since I live very close to the Belgian border, usually it's what you find in shops here. But uh, yeah, I think, Friends might be catching up a little bit on that. Good. It's, it's spreading like the plague, but it's the plague that we want as opposed to the one that we currently have. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to hear about the soundtrack of your youth. When you're growing up in your parents or guardian's house, what music was playing when you were not in control of the radio? What music did your parents or guardians listen to? Uh, a lot of rock music, I think. I grew up listening to bands like Deep Purple, Frank Zappa, really? Led Zeppelin, stuff like that. And I think that's what got me into music and, and into the guitar, more specifically. Mm. But I remember oh. always having that kind of music in the background. Very, very interesting. Uh, what drove you to the guitar first? What would I have been this, that? Just, just hanging out this. and listening to. Yeah, yeah. Because as far as I can remember, I've always pictured myself like with long hair and a guitar in my hands and walking out. And, I love that. Uh, it took me some time to to really get. To, to the practice side of things, but uh, I think that was always already at the back of my head somehow. How old were you when you got the first guitar? Uh, the first real guitar, because I had one before that had like three strings and I was okay. just uh, toying okay. around. Yeah, the yeah. first one, I think I was nine when I first had really? my first acoustic guitar and took my first lesson. And then lessons right away. And then how strictly did you adhere to a practice schedule? Uh, was it something that was fun for you, something that you did on your own, or was it more of a chore that your parents were like, no, no, we're paying for these lessons, you have to practice? Uh, I, actually, I was pretty lazy in the beginning, <laughs> <laughs> I must admit that. And uh, my parents didn't want to force me into to doing anything, so they mm -hmm. just tried to motivate me and like giving me uh, some, some goals, like you'll be able to play this song, stuff like that. But uh, it took me some time. I think when I was 11 or 12, I really got into practice when I discovered stuff like Metallica and stuff like that. And then I, I suddenly I realized I want to play this song. Okay, I have to work for it. Mm. What would be the band? Is it Metallica? I'm curious if it is. Uh, that you brought into the house that exposed you, your first love that you brought into the house and all of a sudden you're blasting your parents with your music. 
uh, hard to say because Metallica, I think, was introduced to me by my uncle because Love he listened it. to a lot of metal bands, also like Dream Theater and stuff like that. Mm. But I think the first band I rediscovered by myself and that changed me as a musician is Death. Uh, I immediately fell in love with it. I've never heard anything like that before. Yeah. I was mostly listening to, to heavy or thrash metal. But uh, yeah, I bought the Death CD by accident, actually. Really? Uh, because I didn't really know the band. I, uh, I liked the cover. I decided, yeah, let's give which it a al- try. Which and, album was it? Uh, Individual Thought Patterns. It's still my favorite one today. Yeah, amazing. Do, do, when you listen to it now, can you um, reimagine yourself hearing it for those first times? Yeah, I've pretty a lot of memories uh, mm. uh, i remember listening to you to it a lot on the school bus or uh, exactly on school trips and stuff like that so i have these memories that come to mind it's weird yeah. eh? how music can yeah, just yeah. transpose us immediately back to a period of our life <laughs> it's like a it's this weird i have the exact same story except it's not with death but it's with corn because i was a new metal child there there's a specific song at the near the end of the record i can't i think it's predictable it's called and it whenever it starts i remember leaving i was in a bad mood for some reason in high school and i remember leaving it was winter and walking out of my high school and just feeling so depressed and listening to that song and it just resonating with me for some reason and if i hear it again <laughs> like today right back to that spot interesting how yeah, music has that amazing, power yeah. now we can just hope that that we're giving that gift to to someone else <laughs> with our music yeah, de- definitely <laughs> because yeah i remember how strongly I, I, mm. I could feel in these moments and if only one person in the world can feel like that because of my music that's amazing i think it's 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 we're, we're truly very lucky uh, <laughs> let's talk about um your first shows do you remember the first show that you went to go see uh, doesn't have to be metal just like a music experience uh probably there were some prior to that but i remember seeing deep purple when i was uh 10 deep purple again and uh yeah that was my first like big show uh That's massive. In, in, a, in a huge uh, huge venue and stuff like that and it was absolutely amazing i still have the poster from uh, from really? that show <laughs> what was that feeling did you remember standing there the smells it's another thing that we can transpose back to these um influential moments was there where was there like a moment when you're standing and again with it was corn uh they came through with uh incubus and orgy and i remember just being like first off i was terrified because I, I was a very sheltered child <laughs> here i was alone with my friends from high school at, at a big show and new metal was sort of people were freaky they were <laughs> it was the oddball people being there and i remember being scared but very very excited do, do you remember you, what your first impressions were at that show i think i was pretty excited because yeah this was one of my favorite bands since uh long before that and uh, finally being able to see them live and stuff like that i just felt excitement uh, mm. no fear at all i, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was just I, you know, like in a mosh pit for the first time all these things and <laughs> i was I, <laughs> I was a very sheltered child Vince. <laughs> <laughs> how about your first time on stage do you remember your first time performing yeah uh actually it was at a um, at a school concert i was just playing uh-huh. with a, a friend of mine who played drums and we prepared like a, i think 10 10 ish songs ranging from like a green day to uh, metallica yeah. <laughs> and uh yeah it, it was pretty pretty cool because uh, that was be- before that i wasn't uh I was a very shy child and uh, didn't have a lot of friends, but suddenly people realized, yeah, oh, this guy is a musician. How cool is that? And uh, I got a lot of new friends after that show. So uh, <laughs> pretty fun, fun memories. After that it's show. funny how that happens. That yeah, yeah. Everyone wants to be friends with the musician. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden they're like, oh, he can come to our camping trip and play guitar around the fire. <laughs> 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 were you prepared enough for that show did you feel prepared were you guys ready to play uh, I, it, it was all right i think i've watched some video footage uh really one or two years back from that show does, does it I, exist I can say does, it, can... does it exist online uh no, <laughs> no it's like <laughs> on a on, on a tape so somewhere at my place yeah, but uh yeah. yeah i think for my age i was uh, 13 i think i was quite happy <laughs> with how it sounded I love that. At what point did the saxophone come into your life? Oh, very late. Actually, I've only been really? playing it for two years now. 
So um, yeah, it's something I had it at the back of my head for a long time. I, I always loved the instrument since I'm also like a big jazz fusion guy. Mm. Uh, and so saxophone was like a natural choice for me to, to start. And uh, actually when I got my, uh, my home, my house that I live in now, uh, I built a little studio that you can see behind. And that was yeah. the first time where I felt like confident to make loud noises and a loud instrument like saxophone and I decided, yeah, perfect timing to start. Uh, how horrible was it at first? Uh, I'm a, I'm a it was it was mostly fun because I, um, <laughs> I I've been playing the guitar for uh, mm -hmm. seven, 17 years now, and so with the saxophone I could really enjoy playing like just a simple melody and, uh, okay. and stuff like that. So uh, <laughs> perhaps it, it was horrible to listen to, but it was like fun, <laughs> having fun with, uh, with like super easy stuff, playing a simple melody, a video game melody, whatever. <laughs> Just what what would be the hardest thing starting with a saxophone? What's the biggest thing that you have to like? Basically, like when it comes to a guitar player, the hardest thing that you have to get through is uh, to build up the calluses on your fingers. Is is probably the biggest obstacle for anyone that's learning guitar. What would be the, that equivalent to learning saxophone? Yeah, I think you you have some kind of aches in the mouth as well because of the the mouthpiece and stuff like that. Really? So that takes some time, and you can really feel like your your facial muscles getting mm. really tired, and uh, <laughs> you have to, to to really work on that. But apart that's, that's... apart from that, I think it was pretty easy because uh, you don't feel pain in the fingers like on the mm -hmm. guitar and stuff like that. So. <laughs> That's very cool. We'll come back to saxophone in a bit, but I want to talk about <laughs> the impassable horizon that came out uh, back in June, June 25th, uh, via Metal Blade Records. Um, massive record, killer record. I, I listened to it again this morning. It was just so damn good. Progressive, uh, catchy, heavy, really, really very excellent. I loved it. Um, how did you feel about dropping a record during a pandemic, though, where you couldn't really promote it the way that you would have if there wasn't a pandemic. Yeah, uh, actually we were lucky enough because we managed to play a release show in our oh, hometown cool. for uh, a lot of our friends and fans. So that was something. And after that, we did a live stream show and still two festivals uh, in September and October. So we didn't have nothing planned. But um, apart from that, I think we tried our best to, to, to make like video content and stuff like that because we weren't able to, to do a tour like we did with the last record and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So we didn't want to wait longer for it to drop. So we just had to go for it. And I think it went out pretty well. Again, we mm -hmm. tried our best to, to, to deal with the situation. And, uh, and I really think that like by the time June of 2021 came around, the world had sort of like accepted and realized that this is the state of the world. I think like the first... I'm thinking of like bands like Testament, Black Dahlia Burner, they all dropped uh, records right in like March 2020. And I think that a lot of records were forgotten because of the state of the world and people were just so in a panic frenzy that they, they didn't really uh, enjoy albums the way that they did later on in the pandemic. So I think that you guys were lucky there. Yeah, I think still these records that were released like in the very early days of the pandemic, I think people had a lot of time to listen to music that's these true. days. So maybe that's that's something. I don't know. It's hard to say. That's true. Plus, you guys are writing new material you were saying already. So I guess you guys were just like, we got to get this out. We can't just sit on this record for another year when you're already composing the next record. Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, we want to keep our our rhythm of one record every two years. So, wow. Uh, yeah, I think this is uh, this had to be released. And wow. One record every ready. two years. What, what, what's the mindset behind that? Well, I think you, in, in modern days, you have to, to, to remain active and uh, keep releasing songs. And that's a, a tough goal, I think. But uh, for now, it has worked <laughs> since the beginning. And the next one, I think, will still be out uh, in two years from the previous wow. one. <laughs> we'll see. Oh, that that's that's very ambitious that's and, and your music is not it's not square it's not simple so you guys must um work hard all the time <laughs> with yeah. touring too in, in a in an ideal situation you guys would be touring as well so how do you fit the time in and what is the the work ethic that it has to go into promoting putting an album out every two years well, yeah, we spend a lot of time working on the band, working on our instruments. And that's made easier because uh, every single one of us in the band is a music teacher. 
uh-huh. teach our instruments. So basically, we all we are always in contact with uh, with the guitar, drums, and stuff like that, and that definitely helps to to also arrange a schedule like we want uh-huh. it. Because for example, I'm a uh, an independent uh, teacher, so I can basically do my lessons whenever I want and take time off for tours, for writing stuff, for recording, and uh, I think that's what makes it easier. That, we are basically doing music full time, so that is absolutely true, and and that's very cool. At what point did you start teaching guitar to people? Uh, actually, I started teaching some friends of mine and some people at school when I was fourteen, <laughs> some, some really? stuff like that. I wasn't really good, and it was just like. But you were better than everyone else. That's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, that's how I got a, a hand on it, and and, and uh, after. Uh, high school i went to a music college for a year called the music academy international in france and uh that was a year only and after that i started teaching like full-time or at least looking for students to teach full-time what is um the moment or i have a few questions about teaching uh, what um is the hardest thing teaching people guitar what what is some of the biggest obstacles to get them for you to get across you have to, i think you have to understand how everybody's mind works because everybody understands differently everybody uh-huh. has different strength different weaknesses and you have to find the best way to uh, to, to teach them something and uh, i find it most difficult with people like children mostly that don't really know why they are there basically the parents <laughs> send them and that's hard <laughs> apart from like, that <laughs> usually when people know what they want to play on the guitar it's cool <laughs> I could imagine so. Uh, at what point, or has it happened, uh, that your students just become too good for you? Uh, I don't think it has happened yet. I have some pretty oh. talented students, uh, some of which were playing like fractal universe tunes and stuff like that. So that's a lot of fun. But I don't think I've ever come to the situation where I, I thought, yeah, this one is too good for me. <laughs> I've helped you. You know, like a grasshopper, you have surpassed me. Uh, you must move out of the dojo type. <laughs> no, but it sometimes can feel a little bit scary when someone walks in and already plays like super good and you're like, what can I teach him? But then you realize that there's there still stuff you can do, mm-hmm. stuff he doesn't know or, or an approach you can give him, something different. I think... There's always some benefit uh, by taking lessons with uh, with someone, even if he's not like a lot, lot better than you are. Mm, but you also seem like someone that's also trying to learn all the time. Yeah, definitely. I'm really passionate about music theory and uh, harmony, stuff like that. And I'm constantly pra- playing music like saxophone, guitar, vocals. Uh, it's always a part of my day. So I'm always curious. Okay, yeah, let's just stuff. start playing saxophone. yeah who does that you do that i think that's so cool (laughs) back to the record um you didn't really get to do it Uh, you do have a cool tour coming up in the fall with evergrey uh but um if you could pick a tour like a perfect package where you're in control you can pick all the bands i'm thinking of like a four band package including yourself so you have to choose three bands that would help put Fractal Universe in front of the perfect crowd so that when people walk out of that show at the end of the night, they are now Fractal Universe fans. (laughs) That's tough. Because I don't know if these bands would fit together. uh, Oh, eclectic. You know, Cult of Lunum does eclectic tour packages, and I love that. I think one band would be Opeth, Mm -hmm. because it's really one of my favorite bands, especially in in later years. And I think they kind of have the same especially in their prog metal, prog death metal days, the same vibe, like mixing very soft with very heavy parts. And that's something. But that's that sounding well. like the same band. I think that's so, so important. I yeah, say it all yeah. the time on the podcast. I, there's all these bands and I'm not going to name them, but it sounds like they're flipping a switch and like, oh, we're the clean band now. Oh, and now we're the heavy <laughs> band. But I yeah. feel like you guys really have an identity uh, in both. Thank you. So Opeth would be like a dream I think then maybe a band like Gojira would be a very mm-hmm. good fit as well because I think they really help the French metal scene overall to to get more noticed and stuff like that. And apart from that, I think we did we toured with Obscura. That was one of yes. our big goals already. Like uh, one of the bands I was absolutely into when they released Cosmogenesis and Omnidium. Mm. So that was a dream come true. And uh, maybe amazing. that would be the the fourth man on the package doing another tour with them. <laughs> that would be actually a really cool tour. That would be eclectic but yet it all fits together nicely i think it'd be massive opeth gojira obscura 
cracks the universe. Love it. That sounds great. <laughs> that, again, there are so many others that we could pick. And uh, yeah. This is a question that I like to throw at people, especially since it's been out since June. Um, is there something about the impassable horizon that you would love to change? If you can go back in time and change something about the record, what would it be? Uh, I don't know. Actually, I'm still pretty happy with most of it. I think like the compositions, the production turned out great. The recording process was really good. So uh, I don't think I've enough. I've had enough time to 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 really get over it and uh, and think of things we would like to change. Uh, really tough question. <laughs> just just being able to to tour more, to release it in a different context, you know, yeah. stuff like that. But still, we are pretty happy with uh, with the context we released it in. Is there a funny recording story? Something, a silly thing that happened while you were recording the record that you could share? Actually, the recording was pretty <laughs> pretty boring because for the first time we recorded <laughs> it at home, uh, okay. like yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> in our home studio. So, uh, <laughs> so it was just not very exciting. I tracked the guitars and vocals at my place, and uh, I was all alone while doing it so really? i don't remember <laughs> anything funny. Be, i would have to i love why well, i record with chris donaldson who's crypt Chopsy's guitarist so and i have been recording with him for, since probably 2007 2005 probably and i would have a hard time tracking vocals by myself i, I like to have someone else be there oh, yeah. to like give me the oh yeah that was good for some reason i need that like i know when it's bad but to really have someone give me the seal of approval, especially when it's Chris's, I know that that was a good, the take. So uh, how did you go about finding the takes for yourself? Yeah, actually for me, it's quite the opposite. I, I tend to get quite nervous, especially mm. for vocals when people are around in the studio. Mm. Uh, and so I think it really liberated me and I was able to do as many takes as I wanted and to take the time to listen back to it. And since we were in the pandemic when we recorded, it, I had more time that we would usually have. And uh, I think I, I really liked it that way. It's amazing. It's no amazing. pressure. Very either. freeing. Good for you. But uh, you guys mentioned that you, you mentioned that you guys started a Twitch channel uh, to connect with your fans. Uh, talk to me about that. Were you doing Twitch before or did you really just start it during the pandemic as a way to connect with your fans? Uh, exactly. Uh, actually, we were looking for ways to connect with people. We came home from the tour of Obscura and two weeks later, we were in complete lockdown in France. Uh, so that was a pretty rough uh, transition. Yeah. And that's when we decided, yeah, let's try something on Twitch. And uh, it's been really fun because we have been playing like some Fractal Universe sets all at our own places. Like uh, uh, also I've been doing some impro sessions on uh. the saxophone and the guitar. And lately we've been starting to invite some guests over to uh, channel we've had uh sam valen from caligula's horse max faust from exist and we're gonna have a new Amazing. one in a couple of weeks as well so that's pretty cool as well i think it's very diverse what we try to offer and uh, i think people enjoyed it and uh, we did as well it is one like silver lining of the pandemic happening at this time when technology is up to this level that we can do that because if we turn back, if the pandemic happened during the 90s, it would have really killed the music scene a lot more. It would have been next to impossible to connect with your fans the way that you guys have via Twitch and the way that I'm doing it through the podcast. Uh, it would be very difficult. Yeah, that's true. And uh, I think, yeah, as, as we discussed earlier, these records that came out during the pandemic also mm -hmm. helped a lot of people. I remember listening to uh, to the new records, the new Black Dahlia Murder when it dropped. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that was still important uh, for people to, to have music and to have these live stream shows coming up and uh, all these podcasts that started emerging like you, you're doing. And uh, I think that's people needed that and uh, the artists need that as well. And uh, I think everybody found something in it. <laughs> That's one lucky thing that happened. <laughs> uh, back to the saxophone. Uh, we're seeing a lot more of it. Uh, do you think that there is a place? Obviously you do. But defend your, your statement, <laughs> because there is some on your record. Uh, saxophone and metal. We're seeing a lot more of it. Uh, is there a place for saxophone and metal? Uh, what do you think about saxophone and metal? Yeah, to me, it's an instrument that can sound really heavy, uh, like you can 
put a lot of energy into it because it all comes from your breath. And uh, mm. if you are <laughs> if you are really pushing hard, the sound that come out of the instrument can be pretty intense. And I think that fits metal pretty well. And absolutely, uh, Bruce Lamont does it very well. Yeah. <laughs> So I think that's the first reason. Um, besides that, I think since we are doing like a proggier side of metal, it's been really common basically to, to try to find new sonorities and stuff like that. And saxophone is just one way to, to achieve that. And uh, yeah. I think it's cool that it's you that does it. Sorry? I think it's cool that it's you that does the, the saxophone and it's not yeah, like yeah. a guy that you brought in to just... Yeah, be- because we had some guests on the previous records and that's also how we realized that saxophone could sound really great on the record we had Jorgen Munkeby from Shining that played on the first record oh, and uh, Hugo's father or guitar player's father Jean-Marc Florinon who played on the second record and so uh, yeah saxophone fitted our music and when I started playing it it was just natural for me to to add it on the on the album more and to add it on live shows as well I think that's super cool. Uh, do you think that uh, you're eventually going to end up being lumped together with Rivers of Nile? Oh, well, that would be a, an amazing band to, to tour with, definitely. And, I'm surprised uh, you didn't say that before. That's why. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I, I love their, their record. we also know my name and really like the, the last one as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's definitely one band that manages to, to add the saxophone uh, pretty well and smoothly into the music. It's not forced at all. You could do like a sax tour. You get Yakuza, Rivers <laughs> of Nile, and Fractal Universe, and it, you know, it could be like a sax across. You know, some <laughs> some some pun with sax in it. <laughs> yeah, did you see them with the the saxophone player live? Um, Rivers of Nile. Yeah, I watched videos of them, but I have never. I toured with them, but it was before they released uh, Owl, where Owls No More. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I, I saw them, I was lucky enough to see them on the tour where they had the saxophone player around. Mm. It was really great because I, it really brought something new to the table and was something pretty unique. Sax across the globe. I'm still trying to think of this pun. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. Um, you mentioned a bunch of stuff, and I'm assuming that's what you did. Uh, something that was taken, we spoke about it right at the beginning. We're not being able to perform. Uh, It's such an important part of our lives. I'm very lucky that I have the podcast uh, right before I sit down here. I'm worried uh, if we're going to connect. Am I prepared enough? I get the same little butterflies in my stomach that I would typically get before jumping on stage. So this is how I've been filling the void of performing. How have you been filling the void? Yeah, kind of with the Twitch. Actually, in the beginning, it's exactly like you described. I have the same butterflies in the stomach like uh, when going on stage. And uh, I liked that. I was really pretending that this was a real show with a, a crowd like in front of me. And uh, mm. that, that was fun. <laughs> it's it's hard to do these these Twitch or, or live stream. I haven't done one, but I can only imagine. I've spoken to a bunch of people that have. To try to get that same energy across when it's not directly coming back to you just like looking into a camera basically and trying to connect with people when there's nothing really coming back aside from just uh, messages coming up in that stream. I think it's really a good exercise and we tend to do that also when we rehearse for live shows like doing a crowd interactions and stuff like that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I do that, that that's, yeah. that's also kind of, kind <laughs> yeah. of the same stuff. Uh, but yeah, you, you never completely get the, the feeling of a, of a live show but it's really a good exercise to to learn how to pretend the best. I guess one day we'll get so big that well, you know, the lights and the stage will be so big that we won't necessarily see the crowd, anyways, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, but that happens sometimes when you have a lot of front lights, mm-hmm. you can yeah. barely see like the, the the first two rows of the crowd, <laughs> even in a small venue. So <laughs> no, it's okay. Everyone else is just standing there like this. But <laughs> uh, I love doing beer collabs. I love making collabs. I've released probably 35 of them so far since I started the podcast. Um, if you could create a beer for Fractal Universe, uh, what style would it be and what would you call it? <laughs> style? Well, I would go something like IPA. As I said, this is basically mm-hmm. what I would have loved to drink. What would call it? Fractale, something like that. <laughs> that sounds not cheesy. A bad idea. <laughs> no, 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 but beer, beer names have to be a little bit cheesy. I like that. <laughs> and then people, and then you can sell glassware where it's the shape of a saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> pretty inconvenient, but it would be cool. And they have to drink from the the, the, the mouth <laughs> I'll take 15%. But uh, <laughs> Vince, uh, we're already at the end. Uh, one last question, classic Vox and Hops wrap up question. Probably doesn't happen to you very often because uh, you're very busy teaching, you're very busy continually learning new music, you're recording, you're writing, you're on Twitch, you're a very, very busy musician. But every once in a while, it happens to everyone, especially if you enjoy too many of those 10% uh, Belgian beers. What is your hangover cure? Actually, trying to drink a lot of water. <laughs> Even during the evening, even when I, I, I drink a lot, my mm -hmm. number one rule is two glasses of water for every every glass of alcohol. And wow, that helps okay. with the hungover yeah, 100%, <laughs> a yeah. lot. But then I usually I try to maybe I go running on the day after just to, to get get some some of this poison out of my body. That that usually usually helps, but it's not always easy. The motivate yeah, so you have to get out the door is the yeah. issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I have heard that. I've heard the the water to to beer. I've heard the running before. The problem with the water to beer is you spend the whole night in the bathroom. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I can deal with that if that helps with the hangover stuff. <laughs> That's definitely Wise one words. small sacrifice. <laughs> Wise words from Vince. Uh, Vince, thank you so, so much for taking the time hanging out with me, talking about your life, talking about music, talking about craft beer. Uh, everyone, go and listen to The Impassable Horizon. You will not be disappointed. Vince, thank you so, so much. Thank you so much for having me. Cheers. Hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right to the end. You know that I love and appreciate that. Man, did I ever have a great, great conversation connecting with Vince. Uh, I love speaking to... Uh, musicians and Vince is absolutely that. He is someone that loves to learn, uh, is uh, always striving to learn more, to uh, expand his musical reach, uh, and I think that is uh, super admirable. Uh, and it shows because uh, Fractal Universe is a very diverse band and is uh, continually evolving. So massive cheers to Vince and thank you so, so much for hanging out with me. I had an absolute blast. If you enjoyed this Vox and Hops episode, you should sign up to the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast mailing list. You can do that on my website, voxandhops.com. That's V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S.com. And when you do that, you shall receive two emails a month letting you know exactly what has been going on in the world of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. You'll get to see all the info for any episodes which I dropped recently. You will also get to see all the reviews that the Vox and Hops album review crew have done. You will get to see which bands Jerry Monk, the metal architect himself, has added to the Brutal Awakenings playlist, which is available on both Apple Music and Spotify. And you'll get to hear about any new projects I have in the works before I announce them to the public. There's just so much going on in the world of the Vox and Hops Metal podcast. I'd hate for you to miss a single thing. So sign up to the mailing list. The Vox and Hops Metal Podcast is brought to you by Sound Talent Media and Evergreen Podcasts. I hope you have a glorious weekend. I'll be back next week with one massive episode on Tuesday. But until then, remember to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. Cheers, Vox and Hops hits. Oh,